Have you ever started playing with your phone and realized there's a little setting buried deep in a menu that you never noticed and that little tiny thing suddenly makes your life a whole lot easier? Yeah, we do that all the time. I'm Marquez Brownlee, AKA MKBHD. And I'm Andrew Manganelli. And on our podcast Waveform, we'll keep you up to date on everything you need to know in the wide world of tech, including all those weird tips that'll make your life just a little bit easier. Yeah, we're always trying to help people like you, as well as all the hardcore tech nerds by going super deep on every phone, every smartwatch, every tablet, connected car, and laptop we can get our hands on. Not only do we keep you informed on the latest tech though, we also have interviews with special guests like Shark Tank's Kevin O'Leary and Apple's Craig Federighi so don't miss out on a single episode every week. Subscribe to Waveform, the MKBHD podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or if you're like us, you already have a favorite podcast app, just go listen and subscribe there. See you there. Stony Island Audio. What up, y'all? This is Open Mike Eagle, and welcome to another episode of What Had Happened Was... I want to thank all of y'all who have listened and supported and shared and big up the previous two episodes of this season with LP. I just want to thank you all very much. Um, this is a flagship program on Stony Island Audio, which is my podcast network. And we need to constantly be showing people in the world that content like this is important. So um, if this is important to you, this kind of musical history that we touch on and these deep dives we get to do on these projects that we really love, I do encourage you to rate us and review us on your favorite platforms. And if you've done it on your favorite platform, go to your go to your second favorite platform. You can do it there too. It ain't against the law. Ain't nobody going to stop you. Nobody's going to jump out from behind the bush and say, hey, stop the steal. It's not going to happen. But this is Stony Island Audio, my podcast network. Um, like I said, we are surviving and thriving on support from listeners like yourself who are into this music, who this music is important to. And um, yeah, the more we can do to demonstrate to people that this is content that's important to people, then we get to do more of it. The more we show it's important, the more we get to do. I should have wrote that down before I tried to say it, but I'm trying to talk off the top of my head. But um, we have another one of our shows, one of my favorite shows on our network, just came back this week. Sean Cantrowitz has this program called Can't Knock the Shuffle. He breaks with the traditional interview format by doing a shuffle, a random shuffle with an artist catalog and then talking about the songs that come up. But I am not going to tell you about it as well as he could. So here is him talking about it because he's better at it than me because it's his show. Every song has its own story, but some of them get lost in the shuffle. I'm Sean Kantrowitz, and I'm the host of a podcast called Can't Knock the Shuffle. Most artists usually only take us under the hood, so to speak, on a handful of their most popular songs. But if you're anything like me, sometimes it's fun to take the road less traveled. And that's why I created Can't Knock the Shuffle. It's a show where I take an artist's entire catalog, put it in a playlist, throw it on shuffle, and then we talk about whichever songs are randomly selected. It's live liner notes with an algorithm in the driver's seat. How are songs made? What inspires an artist? And what journey does a song take before the rest of the world gets to hear it? Join me as I talk with some of my favorite music makers, from rappers to singer-songwriters to producers, in a conversation that really can go anywhere. Can't Knock the Shuffle. It's available wherever you get podcasts, and it's a proud member of the Stony Island Audio Network. So that is Can't Knock the Shuffle on Stony Island Audio. And if this kind of stuff is important to you, deep diving with LP, I think that you're really going to enjoy his show as well, as well as Blueprint Super Duty Tough Work, as well as the Fatherhoods Pod, as well as Dad Bot Rap Pod, as well as Baron Vaughn's Self Quar. And I know I'm forgetting something because my brain is not good. But this is what had happened was on this episode, we're deep diving with LP on the rise of his label, Dev Jux, and a seminal project that came out of that era, Cannibal Ox is the Cold Vein. It's a project that I love. I love this album. 
and a lot of people in the world love this album. So it was amazing to sit with L and ask him questions and dig in his brain about the nooks and crannies of that project. We also cover the beginning of Def Jux, so his decision to start the label, who he started it with, how he picked the roster, um, and what sort of choices influenced what those early projects were and why he didn't come out of the gate first. And while it's awesome to hear him talk about these things, um, if you've heard the last couple of episodes, you've heard me say that our audio quality in terms of the conversation fluctuates a little bit. Um, Week two is better than week one. Week three kind of splits the difference between the two. Um, L was slippery throughout this season. Uh, In addition to us trying to figure out the best software to use from week to week, he also moved around a bunch. So uh, we weren't always able to dial in and get the absolute best quality. But this content, the stuff he's talking about, the stories he's telling, the memories he's sharing of these projects is really, really dope regardless. I'm Open Mike Eagle. This is What It Happened Was on Stony Island Audio. This is episode three, season two of What It Happened Was, The Rise of Def Jux and Cannibal Oxes, The Cold Back, 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 back. You gotta get some snaps for LG. Oh, oh, yeah. Deluxe labor, the underground undertaker. The whole cape is independent as fuck flavor. Audio exhibit, visit the history. To him winning without fucking with the industry. And him losing without fucking with the industry. No illusion, we tracing every movement in the symphony. This is official from lifting of pencils Cold flow the death jugs up to the fist and the pistol I'm sending questions like infinite missiles Digging for details when stories from the past come up And if he don't remember then he has to shrug It's what the podcast does, what it happened was Good afternoon, good morning, good day, uh, people of the internet. We're here with another episode of What Had Happened Was with our esteemed uh, every week guest, Mr. LP. How you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm trying to make sure that every time you record me, I'm in a completely different location. It's it's actually, it's, it's pretty cool. It's like, what what will he do next? You like you like you this know? one? Yeah. Um, a, that, that is a, a stellar window. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to trying to spice the you know spice the vibe up. I don't really I'm not that interesting, so I figured let's put like a nice you know sort of satin curtain or something, whatever material it is. I'm not familiar with it, but you've always been good for uh, keeping us on our toes. So that's yeah. That's what we'll... uh, the hard the <laughs> have I have I gotten to the point where you just hate, like secretly you kind of hate me now for the for the drama I put you through? <laughs> no, is it, like no, it's cool. It's cool. It's all nah, right, man. It's all right. If, if if anything. Um, it's been every every bit the adventure that I hoped it would be. <laughs> <laughs> you're a kind you're a kind man for phrasing it like that. Yeah. Um. So today, you know, we're just coming off of talking about company flow. Mm. You know, so now we get into the phase of your life. You've put out that record, and that record is successful. And you, after being really happy with raucous were soured on that and decided to go your own way Mm -hmm. so what made you at that point decide to like start your own label or how quick was that that decision made we we always had the idea of having a label when we when we did the first company flow stuff we called it a label we called it official recordings you know Um, before it was on raucous it was on official recordings it was our record label aka kitchen table you know and um (laughs) the way the raucous thing soured was that i we had broken up essentially. We just left the group. Me and Len were like, mm-hmm. "Well, we're gonna we're gonna keep company flow." And then we we did the little Johnny from the hospital instrumental album with Rockus. And so basically, mm-hmm. when Rockus was looking for a follow up to the pretty much hit record, we were like, mm-hmm. "Here's your follow up. It's all mm-hmm. instrumental. There's no rapping." No one had ever seen that before. No rap group had ever released an instrumental album before. It had never been not, like not. Yeah, not never before heard instrumentals anyway, right? 
really, yeah. And at the time, it was not normal. There was no precedent for that. And so they were kind of like, oh, okay. And we were psyched about it, though. We thought it was going to be awesome. And, and they promised us a bunch of you know support that they didn't give us. They didn't do anything for it. They didn't buy any advertising. They didn't give us any promotion. They didn't even hire a fucking, I don't even know if they hired a publicist. And we just felt a little betrayed. And, and also at the time, I was keeping the moves that they were trying to make. And the moves they were trying to make were like, they had spent their time in the underground and now it was time for them to go mainstream. That's, that's how it right. felt. You know what I mean? Like right. that their allegiance to sort of the ethos that we all subscribe to was sort of just a bridge to warmer water. I know that that's not an expression, but <laughs> we're going <gonna just, laughs> to just run with that anyway. As, the, as, the, as, as Confucius once said, a bridge to warmer <laughs> water. Um, so I was kind of disgusted by the whole thing. I was kind of annoyed. And I was like, nah, you, you're fucking it up. The thing that makes you special is that you're not like all these other labels. You know, trying to now chase down everybody who's like one notch above you in the industry because you want to climb up and you want to be seen like the reason you got there was because you were special. Now you want to be not special. That's how I felt at the time. And, and I was pissed off about the business aspect of it, you know. So I was, I stepped to my manager and friend, Amichi Zigwe. Okay. I intended to do more company flow music. Mm -hmm. I knew that we had pull because we had sold some real records on an indie level. And I felt pretty educated on it. I felt like I knew I understood and I had an ethos as to how to do it. And it wasn't matching up with the people that I was dealing with. I just stepped at Amici like, you know what, man, I'm about to make a move. And he was, he was in a management company. He was, he had a collective sort of management company called Ozone at the time, mm -hmm. which was also a recording studio in, in New York where we did a lot of company flow stuff. People like, um, Sonic Sum, um, people like Mike Ladd, people like shit priest in them, you know, like it was anti pop, it, yeah. anti -pop of course. And, you know, saw Williams, it was a, like a pretty vibrant little scene there that we came out of in terms of the recording studio but that was where they all lived and they were together they had this company and amici was kind of sick of that shit and amici just always believed in me man you know he really from the beginning he, he was fucking with me and um i stepped to him and i was like look man i'm gonna i think i'm gonna try and do this right i think i want to try and do this thing we were trying to do originally i got a little more experience i got a little more pull i'm gonna step to one of these distribution companies and tell him i want to start putting some records out and do a label and he was like bet let's go so did you did have a moment uh coming out of raucous where you were like maybe we should get a deal somewhere else so we can continue to be artists and not deal with the with the business stuff no Still i never I, uh -uh. <laughs> didn't even <laughs> didn't even cross my mind until i was like 35 <laughs> <laughs> but uh but no it didn't even cross my mind I looked at it like I still had the same vision and I, and there were a few things going on. One, I didn't want to fucking deal with anybody. I, like my instincts originally remained, which was that I don't want to have to explain myself to people. If I want to put some weird shit out, I want to put some weird shit out. You don't want to have to pitch it to nobody. Never. I never yeah. want to have to pitch anything to anybody. If it fucking, if it falls flat, that's on me. Yeah. I wanted to be the boss. I had this sort of idea that there was something really special about the scene and the world that I came out from and that the standard bearers or the people that were sort of had taken it, recognized it and brought it to another level had started to phase out of that, weren't interested in that anymore, which is rockets. And they were interested more in like, how can we link up with the stuff that's a little bit more mainstream and whatever to that, all good. It was their business, and their idea. But to me, I was still like, there's another way. And I think I have an idea how to do it. And I, and I know the people. I've met so many incredible people. But really, it was about putting the music out that I wanted to put out. I was just involved in, in, in producing a lot of stuff. I mean, the whole first spree of Def Jux shit came out of me producing shit. The first thing that we did was the Company Flow and the Cannibal Ox split single. So obviously, I was still trying to do a company flow album and the, my idea was i was going to do a company flow album and a cannibal ox album and cannibal ox was a group that i put together they were already crew but right. they were in adam's fam and they were doing different shit and i met them loved them thought they were ill but both Bordel and bast i kind of picked out of the group like these are my favorites of these. Right. They're, they're super powerful and i stepped to them kind of right right when the shit was starting and i was like hey i gotta do something i don't know what i'm doing because oh just to back up, Lenny then basically was like, 
man, I think I'm going to call it on this company flow shit. Okay. We put the first thing out. It had simian, it had simian drugs. It had, it had, um, uh, DPA, uh, um, and it had simple on it. And that was like, it was, um, going to be for the record called the pain cake, which is, was a private joke between us. <laughs> But somewhere along the line, Len was just like, it didn't feel right for Len. I don't know. He was still hurt by the, the fact that it had fallen apart. I was yeah. like, let's go. We got this. You know, fuck it. Yeah. He was like, eh, it doesn't feel right. And, you know, much respect to him for that because he's always operated on what felt right, you know, and so have I. But I also was not, I'm also stubborn. I also didn't want to let go. And, you know, when Len was like, oh, eh, it just doesn't feel right. You know, something is now broken here. I was like, okay, well, fuck, I'm going to have to figure something else out. While I figure this out, I got to make music. I'm some, I'm, right. I got this shit coming out of me. I'm hot right now. Just in my mind, I just got shit happening. So I was like, well, let me see if I can produce something. And, and that was Can Ox. I stepped to them. I brought them to dinner. And I was just like, you guys want to move into my apartment and make a record, <laughs> you know? And, and um, right. yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to dive into that album in just a second. But before we get there, like, I want to touch on like the name. Everybody knows the name of the label is Def Jux. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, Def Jam had feelings about that. And and yeah. it seems like, you know, it seems like, you know, something done in the spirit of that, but just out of your own mouth. I mean, is that the, the genesis of it? Was it like a, a, a your angle on a Def Jam or? 100 percent yeah yeah it was it was an homage but it was also right. a, a play you know what i mean it was like a, it was a wink but this is something else but i grew up on def jam def jam completely formed everything about me in terms of the way that i move and the way that uh, all the music that they put out like is the foundation of my musical taste like i cut school for a week when fucking crush groove came out and i just kept I just kept watching that shit, you know? And um, that was, I'm pretty sure, the genesis of the imagine of imagining creating a label. Um, so I, I, I was paying homage to them. Um, uh, and yeah, they definitely hit us with the cease and desist. <laughs> <laughs> after a minute, after a minute, you know, they let us rock with it for a minute, but, but what was happening was that we were popping up on the charts. We right. were popping up on the sales charts. And they were like, it was like, Def Jam, Def Jam, Def Jux, Def Jam, Def Jam, you know what I mean? And someone wasn't feeling it. I and uh, I was a little bit hurt, but I understood. And, uh, I mean, the, the truth is, is that it was definitive Jux originally. That was the long form. So we just had to revert back to that. The fucked up shit is that when they, when they gave us the cease and desist and we, we had to sign. And I always made the joke like, hey, I always wanted to sign with, Rook, with you know, with Russell. <laughs> well, I always wanted to sign a Russell. Here I go, signing my company name into oblivion. That's hilarious. Um, the thing is, is that their original draft of what they wanted to do was not only did they want us to stop using the name, they wanted the name. Whoa. Yeah. And they some, was on some colonialism. That's, yeah, that's yeah, crazy. They were, they were on some shit. So, I mean, you know, that's just powerhouse lawyer shit. That's how they do it. So yeah, we had to we had to stop using the name Death Jux officially, but uh, but it had already been ingrained in people's minds and to this right. day. I mean, we're obviously we're still referring to it as Death Jux, you know. So. Where, um, and then so you ended up changing. I think you know you you, you it, it ends up referring to also you know definitive Jux, but then I also see the definitive juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. But I always feel like Jux was it's like a New York slang thing mm -hmm. that I'm not really sure. What does that mean exactly? A Jux. Stab you, rob you, you know. Like, okay, you know, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitive stabbing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Word. So you say you were already in a scene, and you said the scene was kind of starting to split, where you got some people that's going like the way that Raucus is going, where they were in the underground, but they're trying to be mainstream. And you had a bunch of people you were around and making music with who weren't interested in taking that path. So how did you go about assembling the roster once you figured out you wanted to do this label? Well, really, I think what I was referring to, just to clarify, is that Raucus had decided to move on with the, what they wanted to do. Gotcha. My thought about it was this. My philosophy about it was this. There is money and a career out there for people who do shit that is not mainstream. And there is a way, if people put some faith and some dough behind it, to bring the attention to what is happening in the music and not craft the music to what is happening in the mainstream, which is previously the way that it, that it worked. Basically, the way that it used to work was like, you could get a little rep on the underground or whatever, but in order to get into the, the big leagues, you know, you had to kind of craft yourself to fit it. 
And, um, mm-hmm. I, it all came from me because I was like, I refuse to accept that because I'm incapable of doing that. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I'm not ever going to fucking make sense in the mainstream. Like, you know, even now when I technically, you could say I'm in the mainstream, it's right. barely, you know, the mainstream had to change a lot before you can <clears throat> exist in it the way you do now. You know, for me, I was just like, there's got to be a way to collectively show that this literal thing that's happening, this literal person, this person that's making not music in general, but this music is um, interesting and there's a market for it and people will buy it. And that would enable people to just have the faith that they could do the weird shit and dope shit that they wanted to do and really not have to worry about whether or not it hit the radio the, you know it's it's not like the, i'm not the first person to think about this shit but it was it was an ethos it wasn't like it was artists who were on one side or the other i just felt like there was nobody left after rockets mm. had made that shift to to create a tent for people and to be like hey i got you and i had a little bit of experience a little bit of success and I just had the idea that it would be really cool to open it up and become a part of something bigger than and work on stuff that's bigger than just my personal ambition. And now I've I've since then completely thrown that idea out the window and I'm <laughs> all about my person. <laughs> but I put my time in. Now, nah, but uh so I don't know. What was the what was the question again? Well the question was going from Raucous, deciding to do your own label. You said you're working with people like, mm-hmm. oh, is, yeah, my, what is the scene like? Well, I mean, look, it was scattered. I mean, look, everything that happened on Def Jux for the first couple of years was all relationships that I made through Company Flow. Mm-hmm. Like it was all like people I met through Company Flow. We became cool. I love their shit. They love my shit. Friends, you know, um, right. or connections of friends or whatever. Mr. Lift was a big part of the first wave. I mean, this is a dude that I met in 96. And we became fast friends and still are to this day. And, um, you know, all the, all the dudes that were in the loose Weatherman crew, Camo, yeah. Cage, ultimately, uh, you know, the Hangar 18 guys were friends because of Vast and Bortal. Vast and Bortal, I was friends with because they all opened up for Company Flow. It was just a scene. It all came out of that shit. It just sort of built slowly. I met RJD2 through Camo and Copyright because he was producing for them. And RJD2 sent me this. He was like, I'm, I'm, I'm making this instrumental stuff. And I was like, send that shit to me. And he sent it to me. And I was like, oh, shit, this is incredible. <laughs> like, so it was really interesting. And it was really fun. It was an opportunity to be the dude who... Nobody like really brought us in the door. You know what I mean? I never had... I never really had it easy. There was no one to usher me in a little bit. There was no one to have, we had to kind of figure out all of the business and all of this shit on our own from the jump. And, and it was sort of uncharted territory. So by the time I had gotten to the Def Jux phase, I was able to, be, to, to kind of help people skip a few of those steps and be like, no, oh, no, actually you get on the label and the label's already figured out some of these things that indie artists like me I had to spend all their time forging connections and understanding it. And, um, but yeah, it was really just about making music, man. I mean, that was why the label existed, and um, that's how it started. So, you know, the first wave of projects is Mr. Lift Joint, ASAP Rock Joint, Cannibal Ox Joint, all widely considered like fucking classics. Mm. Um, but going into that, right, like, was there any thought to. Okay, I should go first because I'm the flagship, right? I'm the one people kind of have an awareness of already. Um, what what was the thought behind putting those projects out before yours? You know, I did have that thought. I'm the flagship. Company flows the flagship. So we put that flag out first. And I piggybacked Cannibal Ops on the back of that. Right. Because and basically those were supposed to be the first two things. It was supposed to be Company Flow, Cannibal Ops, like a one-two punch type of thing. And so, yes, that was the first idea. I'm going to use my name and what I managed to accomplish to just give a little bit of a, a piggyback to Canox so that I can get them in front of people because because um, nobody would have probably given them the same chance just right out the bat, just with a tape. So that was the idea. Uh, and then, like I said, the idea of doing a company flow record went to the fucking win. So I was thrown for a little bit of a loop in terms of what I was going to do. Uh, I was like, well, I guess I'm LP now. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, company flow sounds a lot fucking cooler than just LP. But uh, and and then I was like, fuck it. I'm just gonna throw myself into the Can Ox thing as my next creative, real nice. creative project. Liff was kind of self generating his music. He was he already had a team of people that he already worked with and shit. That was my dude. That was easy to kind of throw out. But the first record that I 
really put my time and energy into producing uh, was the Count Ox record. And that was my bridge record between me and the rest of my career, really, between Company for All the rest of my career. And I needed time to do Fantastic Damage. Mm. I needed it. So yeah, if it was up to me, Probably at the time, I would have chosen to do Company Flow or my record first if I had known that I was going to do a record. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're coming out of a situation where um, you had a really early weird education with the music business where like mm -hmm. you were in a thing and like, you know, a, a guy <clears throat> older than you kind of tried to take advantage of you legally and you went and got the dope legal advice. So you come in guns blazing on independence. I mean, you're signing artists to a label. Like, what do you bring into that? since you don't want to do it like the regular kind of uh, uh, exploitative way, like what's, what's the, what's the business ethos behind signing? Like how you, how y'all doing it different? I based it on, I mean, I mean, I think that we're probably not the first people to do this, but I based it on what the company flow contracts were, which was it's a 50, 50 split deal, but you own the masters and that's tight it's a one-off. If, if it doesn't work out, then, then we don't do it again. If you want to sign with us again, we negotiate it based on what we can, what we, what we can negotiate. And, uh, you know, the other thing that I brought to the table was complete inexperience in business <laughs> because we had never, we, you know, like, you know, I was only experienced to a certain point. We were not experienced to the point where we knew how to run a label really. You know, mm -hmm. we were learning. We didn't understand it. We didn't have our business straight. We didn't really do contracts and shit. And we had to go back and deal with contracts and things. And, you know, it was really just a seat of the pants, kind of all in together, good intention thing. And we had to learn how to be a real label because all of a sudden it was actually happening and it was working. Right. And, and there's money coming in. There's money coming in and there's bills that have to be paid and there's shit. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, nobody knew anything. And that we'll, we'll touch on that more, but really the, the ethos and the spirit of it was what I had a handle on. Um, I looked at myself like the creative force behind the label and I was bringing the, you know, what I saw, I was curating, you know? Well, you know, I just, I wanted to just say, man, it's really dope that, you know, I'm researching to do these interviews and I'm listening to albums and like, they're all on streaming services and they're not listed mm. under Def Jux, which, which is like, you know, which is, which is evidence of like, yeah. like you're actually putting your money where your mouth was. Cause these are records that you yeah. know, legally you could have still been making money off of if you were doing it the traditional route. Yeah. So it's like dope to hear that somebody yeah. who really felt like they wanted to do a new thing actually follow through with that. So I just wanted to make a note of that real fast. So Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And that's, and that's the fact. And I, mean, I guess if, if we end up covering the death of Def Jux, that, that would be something <laughs> that we come, come back around to. But this, but the plain and short of it is when Def Jux ended, I, I told everybody, just take your masters and run. Like, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I was like, take your shit. I was never in this shit to make money off. To be honest, I'd never made money <laughs> off of Def right. I never actually took a, a salary until the last year I took $30,000. And that paid some of my rent. And, um, right. you know, but, but no, I mean, people looked at us like we were crazy. I mean, I remember motherfuckers being like in the business being like, well, you know, you're paid now. Like saying shit like that to me where we're like, right. who were in the business who also had labels and shit. And I was just like, think so, huh? You think I'm, <laughs> think I'm? But, you know, no. It's absolutely the case. It was never about us owning anything. And the second that I outstayed my usefulness was the second that all of those contracts and anything that was involved was just like, nah, go ahead. This is your shit. <laughs> you know, like I was never I trying to. Mm -hmm. no, no. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to say, though, mm -hmm. like it's and it's an extra level of commendable because you you put some of your the prime music of your life on those albums too you know what i'm saying like sure. some of your like sure. greatest uh most you know intense production work is in these sure. you know is in these albums too so it's it's yeah. not like you're just giving somebody you know away an album they brought to you in some cases it was but it's sure. also dope that you took that same approach whether yeah. you produced the whole thing or not absolutely so motherfucking the cold vein, man. <laughs> I mean, like, yo, this this um this album is like one of the bona fide postmodern rap like classics, man. Like it's a legit mm -hmm. classic to where like I know people who 
don't mess with underground rap at all, mm. but they know about this album and they mm -hmm. love it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like I compare it to like it's it's a different sort of sound, but like um, Slum Village, Fantastic Volume Two is another mm -hmm. album like that, mm -hmm. where like people who don't necessarily usually mess with that type of music, they know about that album and they love it. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Um, I mean, I think, and I think in in the, in the case of Cannibal Ice, of course, I think it has a lot to do with with your production, and I I mm -hmm. would want to hear more about how you encountered Adam's family, like who Adam's family is. And uh, and how y'all started working together? Adam's family is a collective from New York um, that was like, I mean, you talk to like Alaska. He's like, he's the only dude that I still talk to regularly, occasionally. I saw that, um, spoke to Vast recently. But they were just a collective. I mean, this was a time of collectives, you know, and back, right, and, uh, right, you know, right. like in the, in, the, in the late 90s and shit. Cruise. And, you know, yeah, yeah like, you know, you if you had like a fucking weird name and you and you like smoking weed and hanging out and freestyling, you might find yourself in a collective, you know, like, yeah. uh, <laughs> You had like one song with like a you know that like with a group of twenty dudes you know you might be a collective. Um, these guys did a bunch of shit together and then they whittled down and then they they did shows together but they all had their own separate groups within it. Gotcha. Um, so out of Adam's fam, the guys that I really knew from Adam's fam was like Alaska and Wind and Breeze, Cryptic, uh, Cripuno, mm -hmm. you know Vast and Vortal. Those were the dudes that I kind of met, hung out with, and ended up doing some work with. Ultimately, they were younger than us by a few years you know they they were dudes who like knew and loved company flow and were clearly in the same mind state of that world and so i sort of discovered them through a show that we did at wetlands company flow did a bunch of sort of like kind of legendary shows at wetlands because there were the people that were on them were just you know crazy and um yeah and i met them that way yeah, they're just a dope group of dudes who are just like really, really awesome people and um, and funny and creative. And I was looking for something for myself. I was like, man, I just I need to get into something. And I also felt like I need to get into something that wasn't me. I wasn't ready to confront Jamie yet. Like right, right. I wasn't ready to like get into my shit because I kind of knew that the next time I sat down and wrote something, it was going to be a little bit more self analytical it was going to be a little bit more about my life it was going to be a little bit more intense you know than the company flow stuff was for me company flow was just um was just fucking raw ass you know yeah. going out at night and bombing the train shit i felt like okay if if it's going to be lp i had this inkling in the back of my head this voice that was like get ready the reason why I didn't want to do, I didn't want to leave Company Flow is because it's really easier to have someone else in the room to lighten right. the mood. You know, uh, right, for right. me, for me, I'm pretty. I can be pretty intense, especially when you leave me to think about myself too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, point being, well, you, yeah, I was like, ahead. let's do it. No, I, just, I stepped to Vortal and Vast. Like, yo, mm -hmm. I want to produce a full album. Do you guys want to be a group? I literally, I was like, do you guys want to create a group? And they were like, yeah, let's do it. They moved into my crib in Brooklyn and, um, and they came up with the name Cannibal Ox. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you 100% for sure if they came up with that name after we spoke or before we spoke. But I always thought that they took the proposal that I made and then were like, they came back like Cannibal Ox. It might have been a name that they had floated around already. I'm not sure. Had you produced an album for another artist before this, like a full project? Only Company Flow. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. which was which was a part of it up until that point i had just been a kid who wanted to make a record i had never been an elder <laughs> i and you know at the time i was 25 you know for when i met those guys so i had never been a producer i had only been a, an artist so the first song that, that came out was metal gear right i think that was the first song that came out from cannibal ox that people heard that's interesting. I don't really remember. That might okay. have been because I know that Metal Gear. Yeah, that that very well could have been, and that Metal Gear didn't make it to the album, right? Right. Metal right. Gear didn't make it to the album because it was the first song that we did. It was the very that's first. That's what I was going to ask. Is that the that's the first song y'all made together? Yes, and we made it in my bedroom. <laughs> Check these two cats dip down in metal gear. 
yeah. And words from their faces echo, that smell of swim Starving but happy, bombers of stealth Who never cried on yellow brick roads until they found themselves uh, Which was now my recording studio um, And I, there was a, we had a, dupl I had a duplex apartment in Brooklyn Three bedrooms in a what ultimately ended up being a really expensive neighborhood. At the time, it wasn't. It wasn't. So it was, I was paying like a thousand dollars a month for a fucking uh, three bedroom three duplex. Bedroom. So I put my bedroom upstairs. I put the studio downstairs, and across from the studio was Wardle and Bass, and they shared a room, an amazing, legendary room. And um, <laughs> yeah, we recorded that. And I'll tell you. It can't be understated how ill Vorland and Bass were. Yes, like, like absolutely. It, it really, real shit. It can't. The way that I know it because I was there and I saw what, like, for right. instance, Vortal did. Like, like spazzed um, out on that song. Absolutely spazzed out. The whole last sixteen bars was off the top of the head, straight okay, up. It sounded like it, but like yeah. that, 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 but like tapped kept, in, it, like yeah. yeah. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> like, and it just kept going and going. We just like, we were just like this, and I just let it rock. And like, and so I mean, you know, I knew that there was, there was just so clearly, I was so clearly right about these dudes. Like immediately, I was just like, I'm right. I am right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like I'm uh, like I'm smart. I see that these dudes are incredible. I was so excited about that, and um, we just kind of over the course of a year made Cold Vein. They just lived with me, and we didn't rush anything. We didn't force anything. I was always making music, and I was also simultaneously making shit for myself. And, but I was in this zone with the beats that I had this. I had this zone, this tone, this sound that I had identified pretty quickly as what I wanted to give to them. Mm. Um, it was an atmospheric and very immersive and there was emotion to it, but it was also, um, it was a sad and raw, um, sort of orchestral movement for New York city, you know? And as it happened, I was feeding it to them. And then, and then the sort of the more raw shit, like the little bit more like punch you in the face shit, yeah. I was putting aside like, okay, fantastic damage. I was very aware that at, at the time that I didn't want to make just an LP album for Cannibal blocks, I wanted to make something that um, was theirs and that would have to be copied in order to be repeated. So, so Vortal at the end of Metal Gear is coming off the head and it sounds like that and it feels mm. like that. And it, and it feels like these are two dudes with like super raw talent mm. um, coming in and y'all end up making a really like refined record. Was, was there a process to refining what they did in the studio? Was there a lot of going off the head? How did how did it how did end up how no. was the process of putting the songs together? No, it was it was all very written. I mean, apart, apart from those few moments, like that was a gotcha. moment. But it was very written. They'd come in, they'd work on shit together. I'd give them a beat, and they'd disappear together. And I, and they had this such a pure creative friendship at the time. And um, you could hear them talking about it, and it was like it didn't matter that anyone else was in the room. They had a they had a dialogue between each other. Their moment, their friendship was really, they were clicked in, man, like this shit locked in. And I'll never forget, they even had slang to talk to each other within the, within the parameters of the song, within the parameters of making a jam. We did um, Metal, uh, no, I'm sorry, Iron Galaxy. Mm -hmm. My shell, mechanical sound soul, but my ghetto animal sound soul. And, yeah. and I remember very specifically just watching him talk about it and be like, yo, so you do your shell and then I do my shell, you know, what, and they'd be like, what's your shell? And he'd be like, mechanical, found, you know, and like, it was just a special moment, man. I think that these dudes, everything was okay in everyone's lives. And they had yeah. this, they had this place to hang and chill. Um, yeah, there was some real magic going on there. And, um, and it was beautiful because making the music, they just, they really trusted me. Mm. You know, they really, they really let me just make it. And I felt very honored and very much like I got to make this as, as ill as possible. And when you're doing the shit that I was doing, the type of beats that I was doing, man, they weren't normal. It wasn't like you heard the shit everywhere. So it would be very possible for someone to be like, uh, you know, like, yeah. I'm not sure I want to rap over that fucking, uh, you know, arpeggiated sym symphony. You know, like, I, I'm not like, that fucking Philip Glass sample or whatever. Um, right. But they let me do my thing and I let them do their thing. And um, I took my role seriously as trying to help craft it, but it was actually pretty easy, man. There wasn't too much like going back and correcting vocals and shit. You know, um, I think that these guys really sat there, they wrote, 
They knew what they wanted to say. And pretty much everything that they wrote went on the record. You said the beat for Ridiculoid was supposed to be on your album. It sounds like you said, you're saying that in the beginning of the song. Uh, a lot, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of them were <laughs> maybe started. Nah, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I started to correct myself on that. I don't think a lot of them. Again, I was always making beats. So in my right. mind, up until I started producing their record, I was always working towards my record. So right. it was very possible that if I would have done my own record, it would have had a sort of the DNA of that record at that moment. Sure. Ridiculoid was definitely something that started as a as an LP thing. So what the process of it ending up with them, was it a case of them hearing it and being like, damn, we want that? Or you were just like, nah, this is for them? Yeah, the second one. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, the way that I looked at it was I had to give them everything I had, all the heat that mm-hmm. I had. And I, and I and like there was no holding anything back because to a degree it was representing my next step as a musician just as much as it was representing them. And I was like, I can't play favorites here. I can't, I, and mm-hmm. and it tur- it's sort of a philosophy that I still keep leaving no energy for the swim back. The, the second that you start worrying about whether or not you can produce something that's exciting or that is special again, is the second that, that you start turning in on yourself and, and right. fucking your shit up. So I Putting always, moment. yeah. So I always thought no holding back, no matter what it is, no matter how, even, even in that little voice, that little MC voice in the back of my head, it's like, don't give it to them. That's yours. You know? <laughs> um, but I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. I got more. I got a million of these. Like, this shit's, I'm young. Like, let's go. You know, and, and this is going to be the illest fucking record that I have, that I could possibly produce. So, yeah. So I just gave shit up to them that I thought was a couple of things I gave up to them that I originated with, with what was going to be mine. But it was fine. I was like, it's all good. Cause it was a special, I could feel it. There was a, there was, we were on a river. There was motion, man. Like, you couldn't deny it and to cheat it in any way would have been sacrilege. That's really dope to hear. Like, it's just dope to hear when, when, you know, when you're on the receiving and consumption end of something like that and you hear a lot of music and you hear something that's special, it's like really dope to hear that the people who made it like could feel that at the time and decided to pour more into it. Like that's yeah, really fucking tight. We could. And I won't say that about every record that I've ever done. It's not been that obviously special all the time. With the Can Ox shit, not only was it special to us, but it was everyone who would come through. And you got to understand, my, my, my apartment became the, the hub of the New York City underground movement at, at that time for a series of years. The whole Def Chick scene and everyone and our friends and everyone around us. So people were coming through there all the time. Mm-hmm. And there was like probably about 80 to 100 people who knew that this shit was about to drop and change shit, mm. you know? And, and it was not even, I don't even say that egotistically, like it was obviously not egotistically because it wasn't just me that did it. It was, right. it was a moment, it was a collection of people and in a time in their lives that you couldn't necessarily replicate. But yeah, everybody very clearly was like, oh shit, something really special is happening here. Like there's a plateau that's happening. There's a re- run up the ladder here just for music mm. in, in our world right now that's happening. And it was, you know, I give all the, all the love and respect to, uh, to Ward and Bass for that, for that and, and, and our relationship at the time. You know, listening to the album, especially, you know, lyrically listening to it, I, I am reminded of when you were, you were talking to me about company flow and about how much of y'all's energy in writing was like, trying to come up with the craziest imagery to like impress each other with, you know? And I feel a lot of that in the Canox, um, in that album too. Speaking of shells, like now my, sh- you know, my shell is weightless and fireproof, but the truth is I'm proof of living fire. Like that's just crazy imagery. And I wonder like, did you have, it, was there like a, a lyric on an album that you were just like, damn, like just, just if mm. something that still blows your mind when you think about it. I mean, I know there's a lot on the album, but I just wanted to know, like, if something just wigged you out when you heard it. I mean, they both had moments in my mind that were just Hell yeah. Absolutely. unbelievable, you know? I mean, for Vast, I would say what sticks out for me is my mama said you, my mother, when well, my mother said, you sucked my pussy when you came out. When Don't came ever talk out. back. When he, like, <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of a real motherfucking line for a first yeah. jam song, you know? <laughs> um, I was like, oh, well, <laughs> no, no turning back now from that one. Yeah, that, you definitely went there. So, I mean, it was, it was just such a powerful and honest image, you know. Um, Vortal, you know, every duo has the guy that 
gets everyone's attention first. Yes. And, and then the guy that gets everyone, uh, uh, everyone's attention second. Yep. So at first, you know, and usually it's one is sort of louder, more boisterous, more in your face. And, the, and another one is a little bit more um, subtle, a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit more to unwrap. And when you start to right. unwrap what they're saying, you're like, Oh, this is, this is poetry. This is, this is, right. you know, something else. And, and that's what makes, in my opinion, a great duo. It's this cascading thing where you never lose interest. You never lose interest because right. as soon as you, your ear starts to tune into one thing and then your ear starts to tune into the next guy after a while, right? all of a sudden the song opens up again. The Vortal would do that for me um, on that record. And Bass was very clearly the louder voice. You know, he was the one that was very clear spoken. But Vortal had a, a poetry and a, and a way that he used words that was not normal. It was not, I mean, normal. What's normal? But it was not obvious. Right. It wasn't traditional in any way. No. Vortal's whole verse on Pigeon, I thought, was <sighs> one of the most amazing, like... <laughs> Just one of the most descriptive, beautiful soliloquies about New York life. These dudes were from Harlem, and these dudes were New Yorkers, and they were men, black men in New York. They loved comics and, and sci-fi, and, and they had no fear about combining all of their experiences with all of their influences. And so they were making this incredible... A lot of it was really like bleak, like the shit that Vortal would say was like bleak poetry, but also combined with like these really warm, wonderful fucking little vignettes of just uh, of life of like kids, you know, playing hopscotch in an open fire hydrant and like, you know, just just shit that where you're like, if you're from New York, that's why that record hit in New York. So I, I regard Vortal as being, um, especially that body of work, I regard him as being one of the most important rappers of the time. And, and both of them. But, but you know, with Vortal, it would be hard to pull a quote. It's more like you have to sit there and you listen. You have to take a verse in context. Yeah. Really listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he, he did something that I like to do as well, which is use imagery and combine it and to create a larger picture, you know? So it was this image and this image and this image. It wasn't a narration that was completely fed to you. And by the time you got done with the imagery, you felt something. And that's something that he was, you know, incredible with. And I, I think that we all felt that, man. We were like, yo, this record is avant-garde as fuck for sure. And probably a lot of that is to do with the fact that there's a rub between the sound and the voices a little bit. You know what I mean? It was, it was just a sound that hadn't necessarily hit our ears yet before in the same way. I just remember thinking this is an important piece of, um, this is an important piece of music because of these guys. Dope. A couple of quick moments I'm going to touch on the album before we wrap up uh, talking about it. On, on Raspberry Fields, it sounds like uh, it's one of those raw moments you spoke of earlier. Uh, Vast starts his verse. Sounds like he kind of messes it up a little bit. Then he then mm -hmm. he kind of freestyles a little bit and gets mm -hmm. back into it. Is that really what what happened? Was that a yeah. genuine raw moment? Yeah. 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 If first you don't succeed, try try again. Step up to the mic and die again. This is the next lifetime. I hip hop distribution. Either you like the incarnation or the smell of carnations, the samples, the flesh, and the beats, the skeleton. You got beef, but there's worms in your Wellington. I'll put a hole in your skull and extract the skeleton. Oh my God, said a word twice. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, that's. It's the type of shit that you can't, I mean, I guess you could create it if you wanted to. I create, no, I did a fake one and, and <laughs> years later I did a fake one, but that one was real. That one was real. Yeah, no, he was rhyming and he just, you could hear him laughing. Like, you know, I yeah. fucked up. I like slipping in little moments of shit that's happening and just having it pop up. Like, yeah, I think like, uh, on the end of one of the songs, Vortal's verse ends and he's like, I don't I'll have, have an end piece. piece. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I always thought that was super tight too, just hearing and there stuff was, like that. Yeah, because it's like, because it was a moment. And, and, and I think that we all were like, man, every moment is special. Not only what mm -hmm. shows up on the record, but also what's happening. And we liked it all. It reminded us of the moment for us. So we didn't want to cut it out. We didn't want to cut the part out where I go, one. Because like Vortal's in the yeah. booth and you can yeah. hear me on, I think it's Iron Galaxy. And there was like a drop in the beat or something and Vortal has to come back in or whatever. And I was like trying to cue him in and you hear me going one, two, three, four, or that might've been Pigeon. I don't know. And the booth, by the way, was two feet from me and it was in my closet and it was a mic in the, in the closet with a blanket. Um, <sighs> 
so we just always left those little moments, those little stupid moments in. Brilliant. Um, on Vane, y'all use this this technique um, where you kind of like, like you sounds like you you take the verses laid down and you start and you have like the layer of of, of vocals that are dry. And then mm-hmm. you have like different parts of the same vocal you've affected mm-hmm. and layered in the beat. Like stereotypes and hatred, but I ain't gonna wet that and get all dressed out. I'm just trying to make it in strive with my own. Hell, hell, hell with the changes, emotions in the thoughts and rages. Relieved when released on pages. My life in a cycle of stages. Seen through descriptions of nature. Ever since back in the days when niggas was loving and hating. Just, just tell me about that. It's just so, it's so, it's such an incredible technique. Thank you. I remember when I was doing that, I was like, I'm on to something special. And I remember I told someone, I told my publicist at the time, I think I just did something that hasn't been done before with the, with vocal chops or whatever. And she was like, she said some shit. She was like, people do vocal chops all the time. And I was like, no, I I was like, no, no, I'm special. You know, Uh, it started as, you know, thinking about it like a DJ cutting a record up on two turntables. That was originally how it started, you know. You listen to Cat start a jam, and then they start it over, and they start, and they mm-hmm. take a part of it, and then they then they kind of crossfade and they take different parts because they just like the way the shit sound. It started that way, but then it started to play with like, okay, well, what can I do with the vocals to represent what's happening in the song, you know? So it's like lay that shit down, 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 and like yeah. you know, it started to become this little puzzle. I'm sure that there were probably about 25 more things that I did originally that I just was like, all right, that doesn't work. But um, the bop was so jazzy on that record. Yeah. And it was a jazz thing that I chopped up. It had such a bop to it. I, I wanted to throw something in that um, went against it a bit. Mm-hmm. And not against it rhythmically, but went against it in terms of the theme of the sound. Like, yeah, this is a bop and it's jazzy and shit, but it's some future shit too. You know what I mean? And um, yeah. As I, I don't think that I just explained that that well, but I mean, no, I, that think, was, I, I think I hear it though, because yeah. it's like a tr- there's a traditional bop in it, because yeah. it's like a jazz mm-hmm. bop, but then Boom. you Boom. spin Boom. it, Boom. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. but you but you go against that with making the the lyrics sound like technological and futuristic inside exactly of it, you know what I'm saying? exactly like adding a technological layer to it, yeah. And these guys brought this out of me, I think, and the world that we were creating brought that out of me. All my influences at the time were coming up. All the sci-fi and and music score influences and all the shit that I was into that I had started to I think I think they started to be incorporated into the Can Ox album in a real way. And we were creating this sort of poem within this cold New York that was just like New York has always been, but it was in two thousand and whatever the fuck and, and it was the future. So there was an element of that. There was a hint of that. There was a subtlety added of that. So this album comes out and, you know, I don't know how quickly you're able to tell that it is living up to the expectations um, that, that y'all have for it. And after making it and listening to it and sharing it with people, um, but it was clearly a success. I mean, it, it clearly like raised the bar in the way that y'all thought it would. Did you get to like enjoy that? Did you get to like feel like sit for a second, feel good about that at all? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, sit, sit back. Um, Just a little uh, bit. Like, did you like? Because this is the thing. You've now made, you know, a record with Company Flow that you're a rapper on. Like, it's kind of a thing that you're heading up. You produced, did really well. You've moved on into your space as a label owner you know and and pulling creatives together and put your heart and soul into producing for another act and then that has also gone well you know Mm. and and i'm i'm interested to hear if you got to sit and feel that at any point that like this is fucking going great you know in in, in terms of the success response and then reception and everything yeah yeah I mean, I knew that this shit was going to hit, man. I, I just I don't know what to tell you. I just knew. That's I tight. just knew. Like, at the time, we just knew. We just knew if people heard it, that they would be blown away by it. Um, I don't feel that way about everything I do, like I said. Half the time, I have no idea. This time, we knew. And when we played this shit, we played Iron Galaxy up on Stretch and Bob. And the response that came back to that, I mean, I even Stretch and Bob were like, oh, shit. And uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> um, 
I remember a distinct feeling of relief when those guys had their first tour and they were getting on the fucking bus. Mm. I was like, go, go, my children. <laughs> I, you know, like you are on your way now. I felt very proud of them and very much relieved because it's a big deal for somebody to trust you. It's a big deal for someone to say, I'll put myself in your hands. And mm. it's terrifying to some degree. Um, it doesn't always work out. And, um, and it's something that most of the time, most people are smart to just stay away from that position because <laughs> there's a risk there. You know what I mean? So I just remember it's, it was um, really exciting. I felt like I needed to make sure that they lifted off before I could even fuck with my shit. But yeah, you know, I think that there wasn't a lot of resting. There wasn't a lot of like thinking about what was, what would have happened. It was always kind of like, what's the next shit? What's the next shit? And to be honest, I'm guilty of that my whole life. I mean, that's always been me. I've never really sat and thought about what was happening. I was more about what, what needed to happen. So it's interesting to talk about shit. Yeah, yeah. I, I it's know, rare. It's, <laughs> this it's ain't the same what you me. typically do. Yeah. No. It's, <laughs> but, it's just, but that's, you know, but that also, that's also what makes it like really fascinating for people who love these projects because they're not going to get the insight from you anywhere sure. else. Yeah, you know yeah. And, and, it's, and to be fair, I'm an unreliable nar narrator, you know, like I, all, yeah, for sure. I, I, I remember in, in flashes and the way that I felt and I'm sure that there are things that I am getting wrong in terms of when things, but um, it was a lot of hilarity involved in the whole thing too. It was just, those dudes were hilarious. If you were around at that time and you were coming by my crib and you knew what, <laughs> that Bass and Florida were there, you might have Ace, MF Doom might be there. Like you didn't know who the fuck was going to be there. And you'd walk into Vast and Vortal's room and they had two mattresses on the floor. And there was like a giant, like Bruce Hornsby poster that I think, Portal had found on the street or some shit. It was a wow. big, giant framed Bruce Hornsby poster on Bortle's side. And they would just smoke weed and play video games and listen to music. And, you know, mm. it was a good time, man. And there was a lot of good energy around it. You, you told me um, way before this that, you know, from the very beginning, you had reluctance of being a solo artist. Mm. And now you've produced this project, which is like, you, you know, the first one that you weren't really involved in as a rap at all. And just as a producer, and it's gone so well uh did it make it in any way harder for you to go ahead and make that solo move no i don't think it did i think actually it kind of got me on my feet a little bit i think yeah. i think i needed it i think i needed to make music but i also needed the time to to, to just to pause in in terms of thinking about what i was doing and to, and to just gear up because I knew that what I was going to do was going to represent who I was now and i needed that time to contemplate it even if you're not literally thinking about it just having some time is important i have a like a a very well-known run of doing a record every five years mm. all my all the people who follow my music know like you know every five years i'd make a record that was cool until i hit about 35 and i was like oh, yeah. i have, I have five, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like could i do this in one you know um <laughs> But I think that the reason why I did that was because I always sort of, um, I needed that time. And, and so I, I would get involved in shit to stay active, but give myself time to be fresh and new and approach it again the next time. I, so it was like, kind of, you were kind of getting a new guy every time. The, the Can Ox record definitely was what I needed. I needed to get my chops up and kind of get into the mode of really making the record. But I also knew that the record that I was going to make was not going to sound like the Can Ox album. And that was important, 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 important.